We ask Rod Gilbert all kinds of weird things in half an hour. But first here on BBC One Northern Ireland, a fascinating insight into how a 1960s dream didn't exactly work out as planned. Rising over 200 feet above the city, Divis Tower dominates the Belfast skyline. It is all that remains now of the notorious Divis Flats complex. For over 40 years, they were synonymous with deprivation, civil strife, and all that was wrong with high-rise living. The amount of, of uh, anxiety, and neurosis and depression that not, not only myself but many of my colleagues see virtually daily is really quite significant. It had not started out that way. Ah, oh, this is what I always wanted. This is what I always wanted. Luxury, you know. This is the story of how one man's dreams of a city in the sky came crashing down. I almost wiped the flats out of my memory. I think the whole concept was far too far ahead of its time to work. The 1960s was a decade of seismic change. Steered ideas in fashion, music and art were discarded as a new generation took over. The very fabric of society was challenged and revolution was in the air. In Northern Ireland, housing was top of the agenda. Over great swathes of Belfast, people existed in slum housing and in sanitary conditions. Something had to be done. The Northern Ireland government decided to sweep away the old terrace housing of the past to make way for modern high-rise housing developments, similar to those in England and America. They chose to start with a densely populated area in the Lower Falls, close to the newly planned M1 motorway. It was called Divis. I was handed a blank sheet of paper and I suppose it was luck of the draw, just I happened to be the next man along the line when this new job came up. OK, Frank, you can have that redevelopment to get on with. Frank was a newly qualified architect with an idealistic vision to change the terrible living conditions. These terrace houses had two bedrooms upstairs, a living room and a parlour downstairs. And if you were lucky, a toilet in the backyard shared by five houses. It's unbelievable that in the 1960s, these conditions were still existing in the town. The initial development would be huge and on a scale never seen before in Northern Ireland. Covering nearly 15 acres, it had to rehouse a whole community of nearly 3,000 people. Typical of the times, Frank looked outside Northern Ireland for inspiration. In France, Le Corbusier had been feted as the pioneer of modern architecture. His designs were dedicated to providing better living conditions for the residents of crowded cities. He championed multi-storey blocks with individual apartment units, like bottles into a wine rack, as he put it. His notion was that there be a series of these blocks joined by a, a monorail or a motorway. People could get up in the morning, go down in the lift, get in their car and zip up ten villages and repeat back up in the lift in the next one. These ideas were being thrown around generally in the 1960s, and in fact, slightly poorer version of them were multi-storey tower blocks, which were being built quite a lot around London, uh, Glasgow, and we even had one or two here in Northern Ireland, out at Rathcool, Braniel, various other places. The theory was to create cities in the sky, surrounded by open spaces, and more room. This was the idea that Frank imported into his Lower Falls project. We decided whilst 
a tower block could house small family units, two parents, maybe one child at the most. As soon as anyone had a bigger family, they were moved out and rehoused elsewhere. The need obviously was to provide for all the other families that were in the area of this redevelopment. Frank wanted to recreate the sense of community the residents had been used to in their terrace housing and streets. He designed a 19-storey tower and a complex of seven-storey blocks. Neighbours would be able to see each other across the open spaces and he would link the buildings by walkways. We modified what we had seen in Sheffield to produce what became known as Divis Flats. The notion was that you could replace the old streets and footpaths, but stack them above each other. So when children used to play out in the street, they could do the same thing out in these galleries, which were about 10 feet wide, outside their, their doors. Time we're talking about, people's visions of the future were quite different from the way the future has actually turned out. However, the people already living in the Lower Falls weren't consulted. I don't think the discussion even took place about what the flats would be like. There were a number of different agencies, including the Catholic Church, uh, that probably had a responsibility of encouraging people uh, to, to, to go into the flats. I mean, in the 1960s, nobody really mm, was very into public relations as we are now. The only public feedback that we could identify was from the parish priests because St Peter's was the centre of this redevelopment area and we felt they obviously represented our client base, if you want to call it that. In retrospect, I now realise perhaps uh, parish priests quite naturally uh, have an ethos of looking after their flock and didn't want their flock scattered. But that wasn't really the type of feedback that I should have been picking up on at that time. As these first blocks were built, I'm aware that they preached sermons two or three weeks in a row telling people, you're getting into this new accommodation, you are a favoured generation, it's up to you to control them for your next generation and so on. Work on the complex began in 1966. We actually watched the build from scratch. As the tower and the flats appeared on their horizon, the residents watching could only imagine the new ways of living and luxury awaiting them. I'm going to have a bathroom. I'm going to have a shower. I'm going to have hot water. I don't have to heat water every time. I just turn up, I turn a, a, a tap, and you know, abracadabra, that's there. <laughs> can't wait to get into these luxurious, which we thought luxurious flats, you know. As their old homes were progressively demolished, people were immediately moved into the new tower and flats. My mother always wanted to live in the house. She didn't want to move into the flats, but uh, they were convinced. People seen the flats as an adventure, especially young, uh, young people. The emerging complex was being hailed for its innovative new design and a stellar example of future living. We progressed the development street by street, frequently moving people only 50 yards and mothers and daughters who wanted to live next door to each other could still do so. They just moved off the ground up onto one of the flats in the air. The first three blocks of the Divis Flats complex were completed by 1969, and the people from the Lower Falls area became the envied new residents. Phase one of Frank's utopian dream was finally becoming a reality. With phase one successfully underway, Frank now looked to start phase two. This would stretch well beyond the Lower Falls and would showcase even more of his futuristic ideas. 
Within that further design, there were another half dozen tower blocks as opposed to gallery blocks. We could have maintained that type of development up as far as the Royal Victoria Hospital. But uh, we're caught up in the troubles and other pressures. The Divis complex was at an interface between the Shankill and the Lower Falls. When sectarian rioting erupted there in 1968, the whole area became a flashpoint. Violence escalated and a year later, the first child was killed in the Troubles. On the 15th of August, 1969, a nine-year-old boy, Patrick Rooney, and an off-duty soldier, Hugh McCabe, were both shot dead by the RUC or B specials when they fired into Divis Flats. Shit never goes away. The thing they got never uh, And any family could tell you that, you know. The residents turned out in force for both funerals. As the violence raged around the unfinished development, progress on the building was painfully slow. I would go on site one day and the builder would say, uh, we've lost a week's work because all the lorry loads of ready-mix concrete coming up Falls Road have all been hijacked. Materials disappeared regularly, simply because whenever they wanted a little load of timber or concrete or anything else, it was so easy to hijack a load and disappear. There were a number of shabins appeared all around the place that looked terribly like bits of my building in Divis. We were still building blocks towards the end of this uh, project, and these blocks were being built virtually under hails of bullets at times. As the social fabric was crumbling, so too was Frank's vision. The violence on the streets wasn't the only trouble that Frank had to face in flats that were less than five years old. multi-story. Well, I packed my bags, I took a couple of things, I got a grunt for moving and a pair of wings. I started shifting. My home's my castle, that's a joke. I'm ten floors up and the elevator's broke. I need a doctor, flying doctor. Three cheers for the Lord Mayor, he's been elected again. And again. And again. One of the major complaints was damp blamed on cost-cutting construction methods, cheap materials, and the non-porous nature of concrete. We had families ranging from five or six people to 11 and one of 13. Families of that size can breathe out gallons and gallons of water overnight. All that water becomes condensation Concrete, unfortunately, doesn't absorb any condensation, so they were aware of water running down the walls. The flats were fitted with the then new concept, central heating, which would have helped combat the damp. But people didn't trust this, fearing it might prove too expensive. If they had used an adequate amount of heat, they would not have created condensation, but... <laughs> You can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. It was very difficult. In retrospect, I realize people weren't sophisticated enough in their thinking to use the flats as they were designed to be used. Simple as that. They're definitely no good. 
Not for a family. There's six of us in two rooms, as it is now. My two of my children, two little girls, are in the one bed. I haven't enough space even to put more beds in that one room. That baby sleeps with us in the same room. Which I don't think is very hygienic. As time went on, you realize, you know, this is not for me, you know. When people realize what they went into, you know, well, what have I done, you know? But no other choice anyway, because the old houses have been demolished. We're definitely hoodwinked, you know, into them. This is their play area here, when the elements of the wire are against them. And children can barely see daylight, you know. Even Frank's dream of safe areas for children to play outside was becoming a nightmare. The paddling pool is just turned into a dumping ground where everything's in it, you know. With that sort of a thing, the novelty of it is wore off. And I think they've got that many knocks, you know, with it, you know, broken legs and that, that they give it away at birth now, they don't bother with it. As early as 1972, 73, you had the people who were already saying what was called the adventure of living in the sky had been a failure. After several years of internment and imprisonment, Fra McCann returned to his home in the Davis complex and was shocked by the conditions. He became an active campaigner with the Divis Residents Association. When you consider the amount of people that lived in Divis flats, the rubbish chute system, that was too small for the size of the population. There was problems with the lift sticking, there was problems with asbestos, there was problems with dampness. Decay had set in right throughout the flats. As the violence intensified and the war between the IRA and the army became even more vicious, Divis became a battleground. In this particular instance, the IRA are into the right of the picture, the army off to the left on the Falls Road itself. The shooting happens in bursts now and again, and life seems to go on almost normally. People walk in the streets, hardly looking round over their shoulders as the firing continues. The links and walkways between the blocks, originally designed to bring the community together, were now used for a different purpose. The very aspects which were meant to improve life for the tenants made it very easy for troublemakers to move from end to end of the blocks under a certain amount of cover of the blocks and make life difficult for the tenants. It became known as Fort Divis, a combat zone between the IRA and the army. People don't realise how sort of wild west it was in 1972. The gunmen were constantly firing at us from the Divis flats. We saw where it came from, it was from one of the links we would fire back, and there would be full-scale firefights. And it wasn't just a fight between the army and IRA. The residents became embroiled too. You shall have changed, you pinky! No, she's not shot, she's all right. They used to wake up at night now, you know, when they were shooting and the bombing and all was going on. Oh, there's just soldiers shooting again, Mama, or uh, throwing the bombs again. Gunfights became an almost daily and nightly occurrence affecting virtually every resident in every part of the complex, from the flats to the tower. My brother had said to me, would you not go to bed? And the next thing he seen the curtain moving, that was them two bullet holes, and all the dirt fell down on top of the two of us on the floor. At over 200 feet tall, the view from the top of the tower made it an obvious vantage point the army placed an observation post there in the early 70s. This bird's eye view became progressively more sophisticated and permanent. What had started out as just a few sandbags became a substantial fortified concrete structure. Two 
When the lift to it became a target, residents still living in the top two floors were forced by the army to move out as their flats were needed for accommodation. Using the lifts to supply these new residents was too risky. The helicopter used to come in for all their stuff. And this building used to shake. You see, it sways anyway when there's wind. Them, them lights goes like that. It was also rigged with surveillance equipment, which was trained on the Divis complex. The residents were under observation 24 hours a day. I remember uh, at various stages within Divis Flats that uh, photographs would be posted through uh, people's flats and they were of local residents and the, the only place they could have been taken from was uh, from Divis Tower. Relationships between the army and the locals deteriorated even further. They would chuck in televisions, sold nappies, sanitary towels, dog excrement, anything they could sort of get away with throwing at you. That was the, that was the depth of the feeling of hatred they had for us. I don't think it was personal. It was just, you know, the uniform we were wearing and what we represented to these people. And there's certainly an area uh, where the armed conflict between the ARA and British forces took place on a regular basis. It was a social battleground, it was a political battleground, and it was a battleground for surviving daily life for the residents. By 1978, living conditions in the flats had become so bad that residents felt the only option was to campaign for the complex to be demolished. These seconds of darkness have been brought to you by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. The BBC's Open Door programme literally handed the cameras over to the residents to tell their own story. The feeling of isolation is overwhelming. People trapped in their cells. The deck access like a catwalk in prison. But unlike prison, the wall tappings are not a form of communication. In fact, the planners have managed to make people feel isolated and at the same time have taken away their privacy. And when anybody asks you where you live, you know, you just say the Falls Road. You know, it's very rarely you would come out and admit that you live in, in the Divis Flats. The housing authorities did not see fit to provide a dining area. Possibly they did not think residents of Divis Flats would eat. One can imagine the chaos at mealtimes for even a family of four. As well as using the media, some residents decided to take matters into their own hands. The aptly named Divis Demolition Crew was formed and adopted more extreme tactics when flats became vacant. We take the windows out of the frames, take the doors out of the frames, smash the frames, take out bathroom fittings, electrical fittings, uh, smash partition walls, generally make the flat uninhabitable. We can say to the housing executive that if they don't demolish Divis, the people of Divis Flats will certainly demolish it. The Divis Demolition Committee had a number of tactics. One of them would have been to show the housing executive what it was like to live in Divis, uh, that they would let rats off uh, in the housing executive. But I think that the main thrust of their campaign was the demolition of the flats. In 1984, the housing executive gave in to mounting pressure and ordered the demolition of five of the blocks. We're delighted that it's coming down. The only thing is we're sorry for the rest of the people that are going to be left behind in them, but they all should be knocked down. By their proposals this morning, they have openly admitted that Divis is just not fit for human habitation, yet by their policy of partial demolition, in fact condemns the remainder of the residents to stay in this hellhole. Pressure continued, and the housing executive finally agreed to demolish the remaining blocks. By 1994, they were all gone. The only part of Frank's original vision that remained was the 20-storey tower block. His dream of a modern city in the sky had failed. During the troubles of Divis and, and all the very bad publicity the, the whole situation gained, I have to admit I, I just felt completely despondent about ever making any progress in, in sort of housing scenes and so on. Uh, it maybe made me just give up bothering, you know, all your sort of theoretical dreams being an architect and things are knocked into perspective. 
and I think Divis became part of that same notion at the back of my head that you can only do so much and you should learn to be humble about it. By the mid-1990s, normality was returning to Northern Ireland. But at the Tower, the army still overlooked Belfast. It took until 2005 for them to finally close the observation post and bring an end to their presence in Divis. The once reviled tower block has now received a £1 million makeover and new bathrooms, kitchens and heating systems have been installed. It has been transformed into a modern living space for a growing 21st century city. It gives me the greatest of pleasure to officially declare this new culture development open and to wish the residents a very happy and safe and secure future in Divis Tower. Such is its desirability, there is now a two-year waiting list to get into the tower. If you are over a certain age, have no children and don't make any noise. In next week's programme, we meet those lucky enough to qualify. I'm a West Belfast man born and raised. It's, it's my area. You know, I know a lot of people, a lot of good friends, neighbours, and a lot of people I went to school with live in this building, you know. So that's, uh, that's ideal. The flats are lovely. The people living in the flats are lovely. Really nice people, you know. When I look out the flat now as my home, I suppose it's the quietness of the place and that, you know, and you're not annoyed to be anybody. When I do move out, it'll be my final move. Over 40 years later, Frank is proud that at least part of his dream has survived. It might be that we've now proved the Divis Tower part of the concept, which was equally decried in its earlier days as suddenly des res. I was trying to build a fairly progressive idea. Now I think with certain modifications there were lessons that could be learned, ad advantageous lessons, from the flats that we actually have knocked down. Let's face it, I didn't fully understand where we were going in these days. If I had known 50 years ago what I know now, I'm sure we would all have done different things. So next week, High Life focuses on those who live in the Divis Tower Block. That's next Monday at 10.35. But next tonight, you can ask Rod Gilberts really anything you like.